I've got some useful things to share, I think. Um, they arise from several decades of um, self-exploration, but also exploration of our inner world, you might call it. Uh, halfway through my career as a medical and science journalist, I took up a path of self-discovery. Uh, I came into the contact of um, what we call yogis from India, people who had spent many decades of their lives uh, examining themselves internally and connecting with some dimension beyond the material. This is the nature of a yogi. And um, they, they convey, the very experienced yogis, convey a very beautiful feeling of peace. It comes through their eyes, there's a kind of radiance that comes from people who have this practice. And at the time, I was feeling very stressed. I was living very externally. I was quite ego-driven. I needed to define myself by my work, uh, which makes you very vulnerable to the ups and downs of um, how you are received. Because um, you do well, then your ego puffs up. You don't do so well, you're deflated. It's a very vulnerable, uh, difficult way of living. And similarly with my personal relationships, they meant a lot to me, but in a dependent way, so that it wasn't just a sharing, a giving of love, but also that neediness, which creates a dependency, which also creates difficulties in relationships. So this was my condition when I met these yogis, and I felt these people have qualities I want in myself. The way they spoke about gaining those qualities was unfamiliar to me, to say the least, because I, at the time I had a very materialistic outlook. Science, I felt, was our best way forward, the best way of finding the truth about things, free of human superstition and uh, ignorance. And um, so when they spoke of things like that you are a soul, uh, you are not your body, and there is a supreme source of, of uh, truth from which we draw power, uh, I thought, okay, uh, I like the way you are, but I don't really understand this. It didn't have a place in my, my intellect. And over the years, I'm happy to say that, especially in recent years, where I got the opportunity to look at a new paradigm in science, a paradigm that actually is putting consciousness uh, a, a sort of mental quality to the universe first and uh, says that the material side of the universe, the manifest side, is second, that paradigm fits much more easily with what I've been doing at this personal level. So this has been my interest. Um, just very quickly to cover some of the less um, uh, controversial ground, the field called epigenetics has emerged in recent years. When Crick and Watson discovered the structure of DNA, they said at the time, OK, now we have the secret of life. But the DNA is not the master. The field of epigenetics, which has grown up more recently, tells us that the circumstances, the environment in which the cells in our body sit, very much dictates the DNA activity. Um, we can see this in a growth form with babies who are born into very stressful circumstances. They may get plenty to eat, but they fail to thrive. Babies in orphanages, babies whose parents are fighting a lot, quite often their growth will be stunted because the DNA gets the message insecure, fear, can't produce the growth hormones needed for flourishing. Um, it, it, it's picked up in a kind of field effect. This is still under study, but it's pretty well understood that this is the case. And um, take those children out of the orphanage into a home where they are loved and feel secure, and they get a growth spurt and catch up. Otherwise, they may actually, even though they have plenty to eat, they may die because of the, the, um, the negative effect of their thoughts and feelings on their actual physical functioning. So this is um, pretty well accepted. Um, what is some of the implications of that are emerging in biology, things like 
okay, if that's such a striking effect, perhaps it also affects us in later life too, without our realizing it, that when we feel that we have a good place in the world, we are loved and we are able to love, we have um, some sense of purpose in life, then it's as if the DNA similarly gets the message, yes, Neville is functioning okay, give him the energy he needs. Give him the proteins and the growth hormone and the cell repair mechanisms, let them all function well so that he has the energy he needs to, to live well. But if I go through a patch where I'm on a chronic basis distressed and uncertain as to how to proceed in my life, then I may develop chronic ill health and maybe chronic tiredness. And it's very real because the DNA is not doing its job. At least it's not giving me, it may be doing its job in the sense that it's holding me back because it, I need to learn something about how to live better. Similarly, um, the, the brain too, which used to be thought as pretty fixed by the time that we were um, in our mid-teens, that your character and basic template of your mental functioning was fixed, even though you might continue to learn skills, now the brain scientists, through their brilliant um, techniques of seeing which parts of the brain are growing, which parts are dying away, which parts are lighting up, which parts shut down, um, with their scanning techniques, we know now that this concept of neuroplasticity is a very important concept, that the brain changes according to how we use it. According to the thoughts and feelings that we have habitually, the brain will change to help us with those kind, same kinds of thoughts and feelings. So, for example, um, this goes not only with skills like piano playing or map reading, um, the whole host of things that the brain allows us to do, but it also applies to habitual feelings, like if you feel habitual low morale, there are brain centers connected with those feelings and those neurons are more active and more uh, greater in number than uh, in a person who's le who has less morale. Uh, and there are actually um, parallel areas in the frontal cortex. I've forgotten which is which, but one side is to do with higher morale, the other side to do with lower morale. And a course of mindfulness meditation for some biotechnology company workers in the States, just within a few weeks shifted them from low morale, as seen through their neuronal activity, to high morale. So the brain is plastic. And this is very important for us because it takes away that idea that according to your brain and what is imprinted in it, you are a slave to that. You can actually become the master as you can with your DNA to a certain extent. So let me um, move on with the slides. Could we have the first one, please? Um, this book by Norman Doidge, a New York psychiatrist, a really fine summary, to publish just, a, I think, probably only about three or four years ago, of these advances in, in um, neuroscience. I think the title is a misnomer, the brain that changes itself. It betrays this understanding that is so common in science, which I think is a misunderstanding, that we, we are our brains. Um, but nevertheless, the, the, the stories presented in there of, of personal change are quite remarkable. And as the New York Times said in a review, the power of positive thinking finally gains scientific credibility. Because if you are, if you are consciously and realistically making choices about how your inner world is going to be perceived, that will change you. And the, your brain will change to help you with that further, with that positivity. Of course, you can't, lose, 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 you can't just override negative signals from, from, uh, from your environment. You have to understand. Next slide, please. Um, Norman Doidge said in this book, while we have yet to understand how thoughts change brain structure, it is now clear that they do. And the neuroscientists do have a problem understanding how can the brain change itself? Uh, because they don't understand that, as this new paradigm says, we are not our brains. Next slide, please. Um, now I'm going to take you to... Um, to uh, well, actually, could we just go back one, please? I'd like to say a little, a little word more. 
Just back one, thanks. Um, I'd like to say a little bit more about the implications of these findings for how we can manage our thoughts and feelings better. Because this is really what it comes down to. Um, if we can find ways of managing ourselves better, we can lead better lives and be better with others. We can pr promote a, a positive environment for our, our brain and body. That's, that's the kind of possibilities that these, these uh, advances are opening up. The, one of our problems is the influence of the past. Our brains carry an enormous amount, the 100 billion neurons, amazingly complex um, structure that carries many, out, most of it is outside our conscious awareness and nevertheless it predisposes us to react to faces, to places, to situations in certain predetermined ways. Uh, these arise from, from the past. Uh, we may have had traumatic experiences that have left fears inside us which are outside our conscious awareness but nevertheless through the brain dictate to a large extent the way we're responding to life. So there's a conditioning in the brain and um, the, the, the key thing uh, that some of these um, advances are offering us is clues as to how we might become free of inappropriate conditioning from our past, how we can escape the influence of the past and, um, and be more uh, appropriate in our responses for our present circumstances. Okay, we can... Um, now, I'd like to move on to, um, to these next slides because it, it, it's understand the, the key to this, in my view, is understanding the forgotten power of the mind. Now, there have been people who have esoteric teachers which have known of the power of the mind. There are many writings about the power of the mind, about positive thinking and these things. But our basic materialistic outlook, I think, has disempowered us from understanding the power of our thoughts. So I was very fascinated to find that the scientists who developed quantum mechanics some 80, 90 years back realized from what they discovered there when they were looking in the field of the very small, uh, the atomic and the subatomic, they've discovered that at that level the behavior of the quantum world actually brought mind into the equation. The quantum, the quantum equations, the wave function, the, the key idea in quantum mechanics, it's like a mathematical term describing a range of possibilities of where a particular um, setup may take you. Taking it at the very simplest, an electron, for example, that subatomic particle, where will it manifest? The wave function describes a big range of possibilities of where it might manifest, but what they found was that a, a conscious observer was needed to actually turn it from that range of possibilities, those, all, those possibilities suddenly are gone and you have a manifest particle. This discovery, um, which has been very nicely um, uh, illustrated with um, the double slit experiment, some of you may be familiar with since I'm in, in, in a, an institution for engineers, you can look that up on the internet, there's a Dr. Quantum uh, a, a clip from a, a movie f of a few years back that presents the double slit experiment beautifully. It's in Spanish as well as English. But I'm, I'm not going to go into the, into the depths of that tonight. I don't have time. But I do want you to see that these findings by the founding fathers of quantum mechanics were recognized as hugely important for our understanding of ourselves and the world. Max Planck all matter originates and exists only by virtue of a force. We must assume behind this force is the existence of a conscious and intelligent mind. This mind is the matrix of all matter. So he's not saying that your mind and my mind are the matrix of all matter, but, but definitely their discoveries were leading them to understand that these little clues where something as tiny as an electron and its manifestation was influenced by the mind of an individual observer. And since the entire physical world is ultimately made up of subatomic particles, they were led to understand that the mind of nature, or some kind of universal mind, was putting in place the material world, moment by moment. This was an implication of, uh, that was faced up to 
by those founding fathers of quantum mechanics. We backed away from it. We've taken the findings of quantum mechanics and used them very effectively with microprocessors and things like this. But um, the, the, um, these deeper implications, we've not faced up to them, in my view, uh, because of our, the depths of our materialistic outlook, our belief that matter is primary and mind somehow a product of the brain. Next slide, please. Einstein said something similar. Everyone who is seriously involved in the pursuit of science becomes convinced that a spirit is manifest in the laws of the universe, a spirit vastly superior to that of man and one in the face of which we, with our modest powers, must feel humble. And the next one, please. Um, Sir James Jeans, The Mysterious Universe. 1930, with this British physicist and mathematician, the stream of knowledge is heading towards a non-mechanical reality. The universe begins to look more like a great thought than a great machine. Mind no longer appears as an accidental intruder into the realm of matter. We're beginning to suspect we ought rather to hail it as a creator and governor of the realm of matter. Next slide, please. Um, now, there was a, there was a sort of um, backing away, as I've indicated, from these implications for several decades. I personally think that humanity's horror at the, the terrible consequences of certain false ideologies such as Nazism and the, the, ten, the, 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 the tens of millions who died under, in Stalin's pursuit of his dream of a, of a, of a, of a, of a great Soviet empire. Um, I, think that, I think there was something about my generation, I was born towards the end of that 1939-45 uh, war, something about when we grew up we felt Let's just get on with life without these kind of dreams of a better world because ideas are dangerous. And I think one of the reasons for our materialism and almost like an ethic in, in widespread in science that you don't go into territory that is not repeatable and provable, um, it, 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 I think it, it, it's been admirable in some ways, but it's also le left us... Uh, the poorer in other ways by, by obscuring the importance of this, this dimension that is beyond the physical. Um, there are now, in the recent years, some scientists who, leading people in their different fields, facing up to these implications. And they're getting there um, partly through mathematics. Um, this is a very distinguished mathematician in the States, Professor Richard Con Henry. He's at uh, Johns Hopkins. He's very frustrated with his colleagues for not understanding that, in his view, matter is a kind of projection of mind and doesn't have the kind of reality that we ascribe to it. He calls it the mental universe. The only reality is mind and observations. This is a, an essay in Nature, which you know is very much uh, the Bible of the materialistic scientific world. The only reality is mind and observations, but observations are not of things. To see the universe as it really is, we must abandon our tendency to conceptualize observations as things. Now, a bit more, please. Next slide. Uh, this is from, um, here he is, Professor of Physics and Astronomy at Johns Hopkins. It's not matter that creates an illusion of consciousness, but consciousness that creates an illusion of matter. That is correct physics. It is not controversial in the slightest de degree that there is no reality. This has been demonstrated in both theory and experiment. And I've, I've corresponded with him to try to get to grips with this. I, my maths isn't good enough. Um, my reasoning power isn't good enough. But I, my instinct tells me that he's on the right lines. It's really interesting. Some, and I'm still trying to get to grips with it mentally. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is a very interesting paper by Professor Donald Hoffman, a professor of cognitive science in the States. Um, what he calls conscious realism. What he means by that is something similar to what uh, Dick Con Henry was saying, that, um, that consciousness is, is the ultimate real. And, and matter is like, he, the way he develops this in a 37-page paper in Mind and Matter, um, the way he develops this idea is that the material world is, can be compared to icons on a desktop. They're, they're to, 
to make a, a, an easy user interface between mind and this, this game that we're in of life, but that the real, um, uh, th those icons are put in place by some kind of deep mind. Uh, some, and, and this is also taken up by, um, uh, next slide please, I, I don't know where, well, okay, this, this is what he says, we are conscious agents, minds that shape reality, including the brain, which is actually in keeping with this mystery to the materialists that our brains seemingly can change themselves. In fact, we change our brains because we shape reality. We are, we are minds that are not our brains. This is the new thinking. Next slide, please. Consciousness is fundamental. It's not a latecomer in the evolutionary history of the universe. Consciousness is first. Matter and fields depend on it for their very existence. Matter is derivative and among the symbols constructed by conscious agents. This is tough, you know. It's, I've read this paper in Mind and Matter about four times and I'm still grappling with it, but I, it's really good. Uh, next slide, please. The picture of an evolving unconscious universe of space-time matter and fields that over billions of years fitfully gives for birth first to life, then to consciousness is false. Next slide, please. Now, you might have come across this. I don't know if it came to Spain, but it hit headlines in English media uh, in the States and here uh, just a few weeks back that a report to the Bank of America by their analysts said that many scientists, philosophers and business leaders believe there's a 20 to 50 percent probability that humans are already living in a computer simulated virtual world. When this story came out, there was kind of, it, it, it brought a laugh, you know, it's these crazy Americans again, you know, this was the response in England. But actually, I think that um, it isn't a computer simulated, but there's something, there's something a, about this that I think is, is resonating with these, these pointers towards this deeper dimension that, that I'm trying to share with you. Next slide. Uh, yes, uh, the, actually, the, um, uh, you may remember this cult movie. It was a big hit with youngsters from a few years back, uh, The Matrix, which it, in that it was these wicked computers that were sort of feeding a story into the minds of humans who were kept in pods in order to feed the needs of the, of the computers. But, um, but it, it, it carried a, a wonderful sense of there being a kind of reality that we're all asleep in and that the heroes managed to pull themselves out of that and find something, you know, <coughs> and, and ultimately rebel. Next slide, please. Uh, now, I just want to share this one with you too because I don't really fully understand this, but this is one of the geniuses behind Google, um, a software engineer, and he says, the mathematics of quantum information theory tell us unambiguously that particles are not real. We are not physical entities, but informational ones. We're not made of atoms, we're made of quantum bits. What we usually call reality is really a very high quality simulation running on a quantum computer. I'm sure it must be guys like Ron Garrett that, had, that those analysts had been thinking of when they produced that report. Next slide. This, uh, this recent renewal of the idea of the primacy of mind, and it is coming from some very senior people, growing numbers of them, um, and of course, as I've indicated, it was there at the, uh, from the founding fathers of, of quantum mechanics. It was also reflected um, by some Western writers about Eastern wisdom many decades back. Dr. Paul Brunton spent years in Tibet, Nepal, India, fight, speaking to masters who had, uh, in that tradition of the East, had sometimes spent many, much of their lives exploring that inner world and he reached this conclusion uh, it, it was reflected in a number of his books that life has planted us in a universe of thoughts which we have mistakenly taken to be a universe of matter the whole thing is an appearance in consciousness the world which seems presented from outside to the senses is actually projected from within by the mind next slide please um, there are some, some 
anecdotal stories which support this perspective. And they've been coming in increasing numbers also in recent years. This was a wonderful account by a neurosurgeon, Eben Alexander. He had a, he had a, a bacterial infection of his frontal cortex that put him in a coma for a week. He, he nearly died. His colleagues thought they'd lost him. But when he came back, far from sort of suddenly recovering out of some, something, some nothing, he, he was desperate to communicate with the world this ex world of expanded consciousness that the shutting down of his frontal cortex had released him into. And um, he, he writes along these lines, I was en encountering the reality of a world of consciousness that existed completely free of the limitations of my physical brain. My experience showed me that the death of the body and the brain are not the end of consciousness. Next slide, please. Um, love was so much the part of his experience in this. And, and you'll see uh, that this is very common. There's a sense that we are love, that consciousness is love. Um, that, yes, out here in the world of, of uh, the competitive world of, um, of life, life on earth, life, life in this material world of space and time, we are individualized, but behind that there's some kind of principle to which our minds belong, which is in its essence loving. It's, it's pretty amazing. Of course it was at the heart of many of the faith traditions too that this was the case. Love is without a doubt the basis of everything. This is Eben Alexander's experience. Next slide, please. Jill Bolte Taylor got a great TED talk on, on YouTube. Um, she had a, she's a brain scientist. She had a stroke, shut down her left hemisphere. She saw her faculties disappearing, then found herself released into this expanded consciousness in which she, she experienced herself to be at one with everything. And uh, uh, this was part of her experience. I'm the life force power of the universe of the life force power of the 50 trillion beautiful molecular geniuses that make up my form at one with all that is. Next slide, um, uh, next slide, yeah. Um, Jill, um, Anita Mojani, a Hong Kong businesswoman, very recent world bestseller, Dying to Be Me. She was um, being, uh, she was dying of um, lymphoma. She'd had it for several years. She was an ambitious, pushy, um, ego-driven, um, successful businesswoman in Hong Kong and her cancer was taking over her body. Uh, four years she fought it, then she was in hospital, went into a coma, went into this realm of expanded consciousness, got the message somehow, uh, which she writes about in her book, that she's uh, who she really is, if you like, that's why she, where the title comes from, Dying to Be Me comes back, in six weeks all the cancer's gone and she's discharged from hospital and she's well and, and touring the world. It, it, it's a great story. She says, one of the reasons I got cancer is that I didn't love myself. When we love ourselves, we value ourselves. When we value ourselves, we teach people how to treat us. When you love yourself, you find no need to control or bully other people, nor do you allow other people to control or bully you. Next slide, please and the near-death experience. Thousands of these cases reported now due to advances in resuscitation techniques. Sometimes people gone for minutes. In the States, there are certain units where they call bodies and they're gone for hours while surgery is performed and, and they're brought back. And a very, very common description, again, not all, but a, a minority, but, but, uh, but it's common, a very clear, lucid description of this expanded consciousness. Next slide, please. Pim van Lommel, a, a, a cardiologist in Holland, conducted a, a study that lasted several years. He recruited colleagues in five hospitals in Holland to do this. Every time a clinical death had occurred but resuscitation was successful, the patient was questioned to see whether they had had any experience of this kind. And, uh, he put it together in a paper that was published in the Lancet Medical Journal, and he pulled it together in a very good book, Consciousness Beyond Life, The Science of the Near-Death Experience. He puts these stories, many, many stories, into the context of, um, of this new science, this new paradigm. He calls it this non-local space that they, they feel that they go into. He studied that a lot, and it's a very fine book. Um, 
envelop this is his summary of the experience, enveloped by light, people experience total acceptance and unconditional love and have access to a deep knowledge and wisdom with indescribable clarity and insight. Next slide. Here are some of, just some, some, uh, some of the quotes from the patients who experience this. The pinnacle of everything there is, of energy, of love especially, of warmth, of beauty. And another one, it seemed as if time and distance didn't exist. So you see, they are outside space-time. It, it's almost like space-time is our, our kind of virtual cinema, if you like. But they, they, they step outside it when, in, in this experience. I was everywhere at once and sometimes my attention was focused on something and I was there too. It's not that your, it's not that your, your consciousness is gone, there's, there's an, this, this idea that you're a conscious agent which Professor Hoffman develops, that is confirmed by these stories that the individuality is still there and yet there's a sense that you're part of a whole. And I like this quote from one of them, I think death is a really nasty bad lie. I like that very much because I think this is actually a truth. Of course there is death in the sense that we are born, we live our 80, 90, 100 years and the body is no longer habitable and we, we, we leave. Birth and death exist in that sense but what I believe the spiritual teachings and now much of this frontier science is pointing to is this idea that this continuity of consciousness. Next slide, please. Um, I think for time reasons, I'll pass on from this one. It's another very interesting study, but next slide, please. So what I've realized is that, uh, that prayer, reflection, meditation, which I, I, used to, I used to sort of have a certain respect for, but feel, but that's, for, that's not really for me. Um, it, it's just feeling good, um, uh, it's not really a part of reality. But I'm understanding now that, um, that these reflective practices have in common this capacity to still our connection with the brain, to reduce the brain activity and enable us to have some chance of accessing, without actually dying, have some chance of accessing this deeper dimension. That's what this is all about, I think. And I think that's what the great teachings of, um, of the faith traditions are all about, too. Helping us to live in ways that, that don't go too much against our own nature and, and thereby cause a lot of disturbance internally because in a disturbed state, we cannot connect to this, this realm of, of, of connectedness and unity. Next slide, please. So the, the, my practice has very much been... Um, in, this, in this form that um, uh, it's a meditation called Raja Yoga Meditation, Royal Union, and the idea is that you understand yourself as ultimately as this conscious agent or soul and you, you, you deliberately um, choose the awareness of that self uh, as a loving and peaceful being. You know that you're not always like that when you're in life, but internally, uh, you, un you, you relate and identify with that and you have a sense, when you are successful in this, of connecting to a source of light and love and peace that nourishes you. So, so I think that may be the end of the slides. Can we have one next slide? Is there anything further? Oh yes, this is actually um, a, a, a quote from a book that came out some 20 years back called A Return to Love. And I think it's very accurate. The perfect you is the love within you. Everything tells me that, this, that you know, there's the stories of, of these experiences of that expanded consciousness, my own spiritual journey from that ego-driven self to some, someone more at peace with himself, the, and, and very consequently much more easy and giving with others. The perfect you is the love within you. Closing our hearts destroys our peace. It's alien to our nature. I know that I did have a kind of, um, kind of iron, iron curtain around my heart, I feel, that, a few decades back, that, uh, that led me to sort of, a, it was like a protection. Uh, and uh, something had to sort of penetrate that and gradually it's fallen away. 
Because thought is the creative level of things, changing our minds is the ultimate personal empowerment. Now that may be the last slide. Can we just move on one? Is that it? Not quite sure. Yeah, okay, thank you. So now, what is really, what, it, what, what can we do to em empower ourselves in this way? Well, I've given some clues about it. I think that, I think that one of the things that we have to do is not to, uh, not to feel disturbed or uh, kind of longing as we might have done in um, devotional practice, but to actually understand that we are that peace, we are that love. We have to move ourselves into that identification. And of course you have to accept that cognitively as well as experientially, and that's why it's taken me quite some years to do that, and why I'm so happy about this frontier science that supports that view. So when you move into that experience of yourself as, a, as, a, as an eternal energy of consciousness, and one whose original nature is of love and peace and happiness, you make a choice to experience that as much as you can, and then it's as if you attune to that deeper dimension. You've got a chance of connecting to that that divine realm, as it would have been called in, in uh, older language. And when you connect, it's like you recharge the battery of your well-being. You really do. You, you feel charged and you feel more secure. And then you can come out into life and instead of being afraid of hurts and, and the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, as, as Shakespeare put it, you feel more confident. And of course, that then promotes your... It changes your, your, your brain, your old hurts may heal, your heart is more likely to open, your DNA is more likely to give you the proteins and, and, um, uh, and, and growth um, uh, cell repair mechanisms that you need for flourishing. Everything starts to work better. I, I think that, I think that this, is, this new paradigm is going to be enormously important for all of us. And uh, I'm grateful to you for coming on this dark evening in this big hall and hearing something about this. I hope a little bit of this light may help. And um, maybe you've got some questions. I've, I've, I've moved through that quite fast because I had a lot to share, but let's just check how we're doing for time. Oh yeah, we've got time for, time for any questions or comments if you would like to come back on what I've been through. Yeah. I was wondering you would think that connecting to this matrix would empower us? Would empower us? Yeah. Um, the, uh, I think one of the things I'm grateful for with my own teachers of my meditation practice has been that they, they say that they, their teachings sort of connect with this idea that there is this, this matrix from which, moment by moment, the material world is being presented to us. Um, however, they also have the understanding that the matrix carries mixed stuff right now, because of our mixture. So they say uh, that it's not good just to open yourself to anything, uh, like, you know, people uh, pursuing occult powers sometimes may do that. You know, they can they can do some very amazing things when they focus on certain aspects of this realm beyond. Some of the ancient yogis could do extraordinary things with their bodies and, and with their minds. But the, the spiritual university that I've practiced with says, don't go into that because it's mixed and actually uh, that's not what you really need to renew yourself. Focus on the highest. Uh, take your mind to the incorporeal, the, the beyond, to that light and those, those, those very positive qualities of love and peace and joy that are present in that, in that light. There's a nice story actually in Pim Van Lommel's book of um, one, um, one of these people who'd come back from death, one of these near-death experiences. She said um, that she, she went, because it, there are different levels of the experience, there's some where they still like in an informational body and they see the operating theatre, they see distressed relatives and sometimes they have a kind of um, 
realizations of certain things they hadn't faced in life, but not in a very non-judgmental way. And then they go through this tunnel into this realm of light, and when they go very high in that light, they feel this love and joy. And one of them said, when she was high in this experience, is this God? And the, th the answer sort of dropped back into her head, no, this is God's breath which I thought was wonderful, you know, because I, I, I do have a sense that there is an ultimate source of truth, but that is like absolutely beyond everything. But the light and the love that emanates, that is available to us to access. So, but, but it's good to take your mind in meditation to those high places. I think some of the, I think some of the, uh, the faith traditions used to be very suspicious about meditation and, and opening yourself, probably for these kind of reasons. You know, they warned against it. But I think that if you do it accurately, it's very empowering. Um, it's, uh, um, yeah, I think, I think that this, is, this understanding is important. Thanks for that. Yes. They both suffer and died of cancer, which he was cited there as something that you no longer accept. Uh, well, I, I agree that sometimes I think some excessive claims are made um, about the, uh, the power of the mind. Um, I, I think these discoveries are pointing in the direction of how we need to we need to think and, and live and love, but. Um, but there are certainly also um, laws of nature that are in, in place. No matter how unreal this world may be, it's still run on laws. And um, that's one of the things that this Donald Hoffman's paper goes into, actually, this 37-page paper. He says, you know, just because I'm saying that, that, um, that mind has created this material world, it doesn't mean that you can ignore the laws on which this game runs. If there's a train coming down the track and you're standing on the track and you try and will that train out of existence, you're going to go out of the game uh, very quickly. But in terms of, of bodies, um, there, are, there are limits to what we can do. We grow old, there are going to be certain illnesses that will, will take us off. Definitely. There are co consequences of past actions, uh, of environmental damage to our genetic mechanisms. There are many, many different reasons why we, why we suffer the illnesses that we do. It's not that you can just wipe them all out, but sometimes it happens, like Anita Mojani's story. And there was a great book of, a while back by, what was his name? Um, it was called Love, Medicine and Miracles. Some of you might have come across it. Um, it was by an American cancer surgeon, and um, he, he wrote about these exceptional patients that, that he came across from time to time, who had, um, the, the surgeons had done their best to help them, and then finally they'd said, nothing more we can do, I'm afraid, you've probably got about another six months. And then a couple of years later, in these exceptional cases, the patient would walk into the surgeon's office and say, hi, doc, <laughs> you know, and they were, rec they were recovered. He, in his book, Love, Medicine and Miracles, he actually, without knowing about this kind of um, deep substrate of consciousness, he wrote that when that happened, the patient had always undergone some, some major change of mind. You know, they might have previously been feeling that they had no place left in the world for them, but then they found a new love or a new sense of purpose, and that had allowed them to recover. But it's, it's rare, and, and there, are, there are certain laws about the way our bodies are functioning which will, will see their way through. It's not that you can just change reality in, individually just like that, but it, there, there are, these studies and, and these cases give us clues that we don't have to be such victims of the material world as, as we've made ourselves in the past. So why the yogis? Well, they, the, 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 in the East they also have this concept of karma, you know, very strongly, that, that according to the actions that have been performed by 
these conscious agents, not only in one lifetime, but perhaps in many others, sometimes those consequences are going to come through. And even though they might have led a good life in this particular incarnation, still there's some settlement of karma to take place, might happen through, through illness. The, actually, the head of the Brahma Kumaris is now a hundred years, she's nearly a hundred and one. Um, she, sorry? My mother was a hundred and two and never meditated. Uh, right. <laughs> yeah, but this, no, but this, I'm going to say that this uh, lady of a hundred and one, she's had so much ill health, so much agonizing stomach problems, uh, near, nearly died from, uh, from double pneumonia. Um, she's had several episodes where she, she was almost gone, but nevertheless, um, and, and there are others, other yogis within the organization who've died at younger ages. So there's no necessary guarantee of longevity from this, but, but still I feel that it's well worthwhile because even if, you, even if you have it in your fortune that you're going to leave the body at a relatively young age, Still, if you've learned something of this truth, I think you, you, you are on a trajectory when you leave that will, will be, uh, uh, take you to a, a, a better future, if you like. Because part of the understanding is that consciousness doesn't just disappear um, when, we, uh, when we leave the body and move into this realm of light. We, we will also subsequently find ourselves players again and in those new circumstances perhaps we'll come with more wisdom in our next incarnation. But that's not something that is, is the science tells us about yet. The science is telling us about this, this primacy of, of the mental realm, this new paradigm, and, it, and it's good science, and it's supported by some of these stories. Any other comments or questions? <laughs>